no doubt whatsoever that climate change is real and it has real effects. So people are relying all over the world at the moment on data which is fundamentally somewhat inaccurate. Mm -hmm. And it's particularly inaccurate away from the West. Almost everyone is affected by sort of fundamental supply chain issues with regard to climate, even if they're located in a place where nothing seems to be happening. Do you think that businesses have to adapt to climate change at all? I mean, do they have to take it into consideration? Can they live without it? It's a good question for a business school. Uh, hello, Mr. Susholm. My name is uh, Ivan Petrenko, and I welcome you to, uh, at Lviv Business School of Ukrainian Catholic University. Thank you very much, Ivan. It's a pleasure to be here. Can you tell us more about your visit here to Lviv, to Lviv Business School? Well, I'm here um, as a guest of the school to teach a two-day course along with three of my colleagues from New Jersey, all of them Princeton alums, by the way, so there's a, undoubtedly a bias there of some kind that uh, you should acknowledge. Um, what I hope to achieve is to give a perspective from the U.S. as to how we see entrepreneurship and what the value is and what it means both to students as sort of a career path, what sort of things you might want to know. Um, you know, it's, there's a bias in the U.S. that assumes we know everything about everything, so you'll have to take that uh, into account too. But the desires of young people to engage in these types of you know, business opportunities to build a company, to solve a problem, are universal. So I feel like, and I work with a lot of young, young people in Princeton, um, so I think that that's a useful set of knowledge to transfer back over to your students. We all are now witnessing the situation when technology disrupts almost every sphere of our life, making it easier to tackle world's problems. And could I ask you, how do you see the role of um, technology in business in uh, overcoming, uh, overcoming climate change with the next future years? So, I mean, it's a great question because, you know, there's no doubt whatsoever that climate change is real and it has real effects. You know, the arguments were more around human contribution to it, but in some ways that's not relevant because you have to do several things. You have to mitigate against the potential damage of climate change, mm -hmm. and that affects almost everyone on the planet to some point, to some extent. So, because climate change affects fundamental things about civilization, you know, water, food, and food security, um, hazards in different places where they didn't used to be, from floods or drought or you know hurricanes or you know, all all there's there's weather which is a local effect. And there's climate, which is the more general basis for weather effects. And all of those things are going to have tremendous effects on every part of human society, business being one of them. Mm -hmm. right? Technology can both help predict what's going to happen over some range of time so that you can then also use technology potentially to mitigate the effects. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all talking about the danger of climate change and the challenges it brings over. And um, we all know that it's going to be a long-term risk for a lot of companies, for a lot of businesses. Do you think that businesses have to adapt to climate change at all? I mean, do they have to take it into consideration? Can they live without it? It's a good question for a business school. Um, <laughs> it is. <laughs> because it really goes to your how long you're thinking about as a business. I mean... Many businesses are a quarter to quarter, right? Mm -hmm. And in a quarter, how much is going to change? Not very much necessarily, right? Um, or it's somewhat unpredictable. But if your horizon for thinking about your business is long enough term that you can evaluate these things, or you're a public company and you need to disclose to shareholders what you're doing to keep your business viable, then you really have to think about it. Now it's sector by sector, right? Like a, you know, a, a supermarket chain has different mm -hmm. um, things to worry about than a global oil company. But almost everyone is affected by sort of fundamental supply chain issues with regard to climate. Even if they're located in a place where nothing seems to be happening, their energy prices might go up, or they might be dependent on supplies from some place. You know, you're at, you, have a, you have a phone, there may be a component there that's in some Chinese factory 
that's unusually depend, you know, vulnerable to flooding. Um, it's an enormously complex web of, um, that keeps modern society running. And disruptions to it at any point, um, even in places where you may not be thinking you're vulnerable, can affect your business. So what would be your advice to those businesses that around the world that actually do take it seriously and want to make change, that want to adapt to climate change? What would you advise? Well, I'm not really governor of the world yet, so I can't really uh, make my views um, re you know, real. I think one thing I would say, though, is that there's what I would call a money ball problem that they all face. Um, there's an American author, Michael Lewis, and some of you may have read, um, and he's written a lot of books um, about, about baseball and about working in an investment bank and about the mortgage security crisis. And um, he's a good writer. Every one of his stories really is about the fact that there's a group of people relying on data that they don't know is wrong. It looks good, right? Someone can come up with a map showing Oh, here was the historical, you know, precipitate rainfall in, you know, Senegal or something. And how can you tell it was wrong? It'd be very difficult. Only a few really good scientists could probably look at it and say, well, you didn't get that. That's not right. Um, so people are relying all over the world at the moment on data which is fundamentally somewhat inaccurate. Mm -hmm. And it's particularly inaccurate away from the West. Um, if you're basing decisions on your you know, cocoa production, you might just not be using accurate data, and that's going to drive all kinds of things about price and yield and risk. Um, that's increasingly going to be true, and that's the thing you should worry about if you're running a company, which is that your own analysis of risk may be based on fundamentally faulty assumptions. Mm -hmm. So the planning that you're doing, you really need to go back and look at both how things are changing, but what you're using what your sources of information are in the first place. Okay, and then the next question would be, um, you've mentioned previously um, about the initiatives and products that you come up at the university that uh, are aimed uh, on climate change and uh, solving all this situation. Could you tell me more about that? Certainly. I mean, you know, as background, I have a, a role as an executive in residence at Princeton University. and what. That means is that I'm, you know, my mission is to help get the research out of the university and into places where it can be useful either commercially or to help people and you know, areas in need. So you know, what that means to me is that grant-funded research, which is what a major university tends to do, Right, that's what mostly the professors are interested in. They like teaching sometimes, but they mm -hmm. also really like doing research. Um, but oftentimes the research is very advanced and there are many papers published, but there is a gap between that and its use in, you know, by the real world, if I may put it that way. Mm -hmm. So bridging that gap, traditionally companies sponsor research and you know, do things with it. Um, or people read a paper and say, oh, oh, I can use this and I can figure out how to increase you know, crop yield through genetic engineering of crops, things like that, um, or new drugs or new pharma-type products that come out of research. In the case of Princeton Climate, the idea was that the group had built a very impressive global system for gridded hydrology. So essentially the idea is that there's a standardized database across time and geography, which is the most accurate representation of things like precipitation and temperature. And that comes from a lot of sources. That comes from satellite observation, the satellites you know, cover the Earth, ground stations, physical models of the land surface and the rivers and the mountains and the terrain, understanding soil and soil absorption, evaporation, the whole techniques of hydrology. But what that gives you is a more accurate historical view and a real-time view and assumingly, you know, sort of forecast view mm -hmm. of what's going on with water. And that leads in a lot of directions. Okay, and uh, the company, your company, uh, Princeton Climate Analytics, um, 
can you specify what, on what stage you're in? What, uh, on what stage of market you are? At? So relatively early stage because, you know, for when a, it's called a spin out mm -hmm. uh, rather, or a spin off rather than a startup, right? And the difference is that you start with an asset. You start with something, in our case, licensed from Princeton University. Um, and that's great, right? Because a normal startup starts from like zero, right? You have to build everything. You have to you know, write the initial code. You have to do things. But a, a spin out of a university, you have access to something that may have cost a lot of money and time and expertise to build. So we spun it out, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this asset, this hydrological data model and all these things that are running all the time, you know, watching the world and, and analyzing it. So then the next step from that is to identify the commercial sectors which you want to sell to. And for something like this, you're a good entrepreneur, you can probably imagine all the things that you might do if you had, you knew more about sort of water um, in the world. So there's, you know, commodities, right? If you, if you know more about water, you know more about agriculture, you know more about, you know, crop yields. And particularly in places where our data is valuable is the places in the developing world. There's very good coverage in the West of stuff like this. It's like they, they have good radar, they have good data, they know a lot about Ukrainian wheat or American corn, mm -hmm. but they don't know much about places like Africa or Latin America or parts of Asia where the ground data is not particularly good. So that's one sector, agriculture in the developing world, which is potentially very valuable to us. That also applies to governments and NGOs who want to use our data to help people who are really in danger in Africa from drought and from flood and from those types of hazards because it's a huge problem. You know, you can mitigate those things in the West because you have money and you can, you can do things. But there, you know, it's, it's potentially very hazardous to an awful lot of people and it's poorly understood because the ground data isn't particularly good. You know, ground station measurements in Africa, there's, the stations are sparse and in fact they're getting, the information is not particularly accurate. Mm -hmm. So that's where the combined analysis of lots of different data sources, and all your data science guys will understand this, is really valuable because you can apply statistical methods and you have ground stations, and you have satellite data, and you have you know, lots of different models. Mm -hmm. So you can say what's going on you know, between the two stations Normally what people do is they statistically average, but that's poor if they're sparse or they're not accurate. Yeah. So you, if you have the full, all, use all the techniques, you can get a much better understanding of what's going on on the ground between the stations. Mm -hmm. And that's the essence of what we have to offer. And there, there are endless markets, right? There's climate finance, there's reinsurance. Anywhere where risk um, is important, that's so where we can play. Data is of vital importance for you and for your project. Um, how do you gather data from throughout the world? Do you cooperate with governments, with organizations, uh, with private companies? It's, a good, it's an excellent question. Most satellite data is freely available. Mm -hmm. So from ESA or NASA, you can go to a site and you can FTP it down, and there it is. And you might say, well, that's all everyone should do. Um, ground station data is somewhat freely available depending on what part of the world you're in. For some countries, it's a national security issue, so they don't like to release it. But in a lot of places, it's somewhat freely available. The, the trick is that integrating all these data sources, they're different, right? Mm -hmm. the, the raw data from the satellites contains, contains errors, it changes the instruments, um, new, new orbiters you know, are up there. NASA changes its, you know, the way in which it downloads the data, the periods are all different. So trying to even make it consistent between all the data sources is a huge task. Mm -hmm. um, and not for the, the faint of heart. Most people just want to consume the output of this thing. They don't want to go through all the trouble of trying to make it right. Um, so it's a large task because you have to continuously sample all of these different sources and then do the integration steps and the cleaning up and producing refined output. You know, in Silicon Valley, sometimes they say that this is a, a data refinery, right? 
you have like raw crude coming in, and then what comes out is aviation fuel and kerosene and mm -hmm. gasoline and diesel. So in some ways, we have to act like a, a big data refinery, and we just have to keep the pipes moving and the output going. So perhaps that's an answer to your question. Yeah, it is. Um, it was a great pl pleasure talking to you. Uh, I wish you a great you. visit here in Lviv, Lviv Business School of Ukrainian Catholic University. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Well, thank you. And Ukrainian hospitality is first rate. Thank you. Thank it was you. nice to hear that. <laughs>